Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton, an associate professor and chair of the Department of Health, Human Services, and Public Policy at California State University, Monterey Bay. Welcome to Black Doctors Talk podcast, Dr. Lopez Littleton. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I would love if you would just please start out by just sharing a little more about your background. Let our viewers know where it all began for you. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. I typically, when people ask that question, I put it into three big pots because I've got a a very diverse and varied background. And so um, first, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, I'm a military veteran. I was in the United States Army. Um, I'm a registered nurse. Um, I've done medical, surgical nursing, um, oncology nursing, lots of different types of nursing. Um, My favorite was um, mother baby nursing. Um, And then in kind of like the realm where I am now, I served as an executive director of a nonprofit organization in Orlando, Florida, where I was for about 15 years. Um, And now I'm in um, academia. And um, something that's interesting about me that most people don't know is that I have um, worked um, at um, a historically black college and university, which is Grambling State University. I'm now working at a Hispanic serving institution, which is California State University, Monterey Bay. And I've also worked at the University of Central Florida, which is a predominantly white institution. So I've got this very varied and diverse background, as you can see. And so I like to tell people about, you know, kind of that that centers and grounds me in the work that I do now in working to improve health and health outcomes for people who look like me, in particular, Black women. I love that. And thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, (laughs) Such a vast background. Um, It's just amazing. Who has been a tremendous impact on you in your career field? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I I had um, kind of adopted a mentor, um, Dr. Kamara Jones, who um, I was a presidential management fellow at the CDC back in, I think it was 2011-ish, somewhere there, 2011, 2012. And um, I got to meet her. I'd been reading her articles and I listened to her talk. She's um, very noted in the field of public health. She's done a lot of work on institutional racism and systems of oppression. And um, one day I was doing something, you know, at work at the CDC and I came across her name. She was doing a talk and I was like, oh, I didn't know she worked at the CDC. The vast majority of her work does didn't have CDC on it at the time. And so I got to, um, I, I sent her an email. She responded promptly. Um, I got to go to lunch with her. And she is one of the people who I think has in shaped and, and informed my career um, currently. And I say that because a lot of the work that I'm doing relates to racism and systems of oppression. Um, Before I got to meet her, I'd already kind of been doing this work before, but I think after having that interaction with her and learning about some of her struggles inside um, federal organizations, um, I just came to realize that if we're going to make a difference in the health and health outcomes of Black women, then we're going to have to really push to make systemic change. Um, I recently heard about one of the big projects that's coming out, um, you know, private companies partnering with HBCUs, dumping millions of dollars into particular programs. And even though that's great, I'm excited to hear about that. We don't really need programs. We actually need systemic change. I think it's a yes and. Yes, we need that. But at the same time, we actually need to do things that's going to create opportunities and advance health opportunities for Black women if we're ever going to have a just and equitable society. I love that. And you mentioned your mentor. How important is mentoring, you know, to one's career? Yeah, I think mentoring is so important. Um, I created a vision board this um, this year for the first time ever. And on it, I put on my vision board that I want to pour into others. So um, I think when we achieve a level of success and you don't have to be at the pinnacle of your career, 
But wherever you are, you have an opportunity to reach back and make sure that you're bringing people along. And so I think for me, it's been critical all along. I have some very important people in my life. Like, you know, when I give speeches, I always refer back to my mother. Um, and sometimes it's not in the best light. Um, I'm, sometimes it's that interesting dichotomy. I think um, when she makes statements like you can't fight City Hall and I'm like, Oh yes, you can. You know, so you know, inspiration comes in different forms. So, you know, one of the things that I will tell women is that don't be afraid to ask someone to mentor you, and don't be afraid to take on informal mentorship roles. Those relationships are sometimes key to opening up additional opportunities for you. So, I do informal mentoring as well as formal mentoring, and I think it's critical. I absolutely agree. Now, what would you say is the key to a fulfilled life? You have um, almost, I, I just, when, when, when I talk to you, when I hear all the things that you've done, I just, I hear abundance. How, mm -hmm. what, what do you feel is the key to having that fulfilled life? Yeah. So I think for me, you know, I think about, you know, my daughter sometimes, you know, makes a joke. She, she thinks I've got it all together, but I always feel like I tell her, I feel like a duck, like on the top of the water, I'm nice and calm, but underneath I'm hustling, right? And so I think for me, it's that internal drive um, for success. And that internal drive for success is something that I think extends on me because my success is not just for me. My success is for a, a whole host of people. So I have three children. So I wanna be able to create a life where they can look back and say their mother not only provided for them, but created all these avenues and opportunities for them and for other people. So that is so important for me. And so I think the other thing for me is I've learned about balance. Um, in that I don't have to do everything for everyone. I'm still really learning how to say no. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're hungry and you're out here trying to make things happen, when these opportunities come up, you're just taking on everything and you're not thinking about the wear and tear that it has on your soul. And so for me, I think, you know, I don't want to say in my ripe old age, as I, as I, you know, kind of get on up there in age, I spend more time thinking about the impact that I have on my, on my, on my physical body. So I try to um, put myself in a, a situation where I can um, demonstrate that health, fitness, um, mental health, that all of those things are important and that we have to find a way to, um, you know, showcase that not only to other people, I think it's for showcasing it to yourself, that I can be healthy, I can be fit, I can be inspirational, I can be aspirational, but I can take care of myself. And so I think that that's kind of how all of these things culminate for me. And you made some valid points. I think I think it's Lisa Nichols that says no is a complete sentence. And I think most of us need to really adhere to that because you're exactly right. We take on all of these um, tasks, <laughs> um, but you know, not really realizing the cost of taking on those tasks. For every yes, there's a no to something and that could be just a peace of mind. So very mm -hmm. valid points. Thank you for that. What is one thing you wish you had known earlier in your career? <sighs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, I think I wish, I guess for me, it's okay to fail. Um, I think, you know, I was an athlete. I was, um, I played basketball, I ran track and did some other things, but I think winning becomes central to um, us. And, you know, we want the perfect life, the perfect husband, the perfect, you know, number of children, children doing well in school, you know, and I think what I've learned is that failure is, is a, is a lesson unto itself. And so what I do now is I look at it as opportunity. So just because one door closes, you know, you've got to look for that door that is open. And so instead of sitting, staring at the closed door, right? 
um, my daughter's in the process of buying a car and um, she wanted she wanted to go look at the car on Saturday. And by the time Saturday rolled around, someone had purchased the car and she was, you know, all sad and wanting to cry. And I'm like, OK, that was not your car. <laughs> There's other cars out there for you. And so I just, um, I wish I'd, uh, you know, kind of learned that lesson earlier and, you know, not being afraid to take some risk. I love that. And it's really a great segue into my next question about failures. Um, one that you can share, what would you consider is one of your biggest failures, but what did you learn from it? Mm -hmm. So people don't know this. People think, you know, okay, you went to nursing school, you got through it, and then you're, you're a nurse, right? But people don't understand the number of failures that I had while I was in nursing school. Um, I wasn't successful in my marriage, so my relationships faltered. I was, I, you know, for lack of a better term, I was poor. You know, I didn't have any money. I was going to school full time. I think, you know, it was what I call, I was in the throes of, of learning, of growing. And I, I look back at the struggles and it's because of those struggles that I'm able to, you know, have the confidence that I have today, that I can have conversations with people, you know, CEOs, I can have, comp you know, with whoever you are. But then at the same time, I'm still connected with people, you know, the janitorial staff, you know, the people who are on the front lines, the, the, the service workers, um, those are still my people. Um, my mother, when I grew up, she was a seamstress, but sometimes in between, she actually did what they refer to as private homework. And so now we refer to those people as maids or housekeepers. But, you know, my mother, she got her hustle on, and, you know, because of the sacrifices she made, um, I'm able to do more. And so for me, I just really want wherever I am and whatever I'm able to do that my children and the next generation of black women and black men that they're able to do even more. So that's kind of where I'm situated in that. I love that. And you know, I'm such a proponent of really being intentional about the next generation, who's coming after us and making sure that we're setting them up as much as possible for success. I love that. So what advice would you give to someone who is desiring to pursue a career that's similar to yours? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm working with a couple of young women from across the country who are in just different places. Um, one's in law school, one's in nursing school, one's still in high school. <laughs> just, and one of the things that I, I really try to um, impress upon them is to, um, which was a piece of advice that I received, bloom where you're planted. A lot of times people are looking at the end goal and not really focused on where they are now. And so you really have to um, tap into yourself wherever you are and own your successes and own the relationships. Um, the same people that you see on the way up are the same ones you may see on the way down. It's no prophecy there, but really trying to um, get young people to understand that um, you know, it's the work that you put in at every level that sets you up for success. And so, you know, thinking back to when I was a nurse, one of the things that I wanted to do as a nurse was I was trying to find a way to stand out. And so what I did is I became very good at starting IVs. And so when people came to the floor, you know, if someone needed that was a hard stick and needed an IV done, hey, call Vanessa, she's got you, right? And so no matter where I was or what I was doing, I always tried to find a way to be, um, to be helpful that I could, you know, people could tap into a skill or resource that I have. And that's the same way I am right now. You know, I got to be the chair of my department, not just because it was my turn to be the department chair, but because I have a tremendous work ethic and I have great relationships across the campus. And then I'm really willing to demonstrate a commitment to my faculty in that relationship that we have with administration. And so, you know, super excited about all those opportunities, but that's kind of where I sit. <laughs> Thank you. So with so much going on now, you're in academia, you're a registered nurse, so many things that you have to stay abreast of. How do you stay abreast of current trends in all of the many different areas um, that you're responsible for? 
Absolutely. Um, I guess I cheat. <laughs> I have a lot of good friends and a lot of good, my, a lot of my friends are avid readers. And so I'm in like a ton of different private chats and people are always like bringing in things, bringing in technology, poetry, science. So a lot of times I actually don't have to go out looking for stuff. Um, it just lands in my lap and then I can just take it from there. Um, I'm an avid reader. Um, my goal um, for this year is one book a month, um, which might sound ambitious to somebody, but it's actually kind of pulling back for me. <laughs> um, and so I'm just, um, I'm super excited about, um, you know, these opportunities I have to showcase the work that I'm doing for other people. I love that. So we've talked about failures. We've talked about lessons learned from failures. What are some of your biggest accomplishments to date? Okay, <laughs> good question. Um, I, my biggest accomplishments, like if I had to line them all up is um, definitely getting my PhD. Um, I feel like, I don't want to say it's cheating, but it was a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice that's involved in that. Um, I started at the University of Central Florida back in 2007. And when I signed up, I was working full time. I thought I'd have to pay my way. And I ended up getting a, a full scholarship. I was a McKnight um, fellow. And so, and but I didn't find that out until after I had gotten accepted. And so that was just like a wonderful benefit, something that happened along the way. And then I, at the University of Central Florida, um, there were just so many opportunities that were presented to me um, from networking with tremendous faculty, um, you know, starting up a student club, working, you know, being a part of the Black Doctoral Network and being a part of, um, you know, starting groups with um, other Black PhDs from, you know, the, from UCF as well. Um, I just want to say that the whole journey was just a tremendous journey. Um, and in that's actually, it's funny because I was working on my PhD, but I went to um, Louisiana for about a year and a half because I, look, I was tired of being poor. <laughs> so I went to, and that's when I accepted the job um, doing public relations at Grambling, um, just because I wanted to generate income for me and my family. And so, but one of the things I quickly found out is that trying to hold down a full-time job like that and finish up a PhD was, you know, next to impossible for me. Some folks are able to do it, but I wasn't. And so I did quit and go back to, you know, UCF so I can just lock myself up in a room and study for a long period of time. So, you know, it, it, it's a part, it's um, the doctoral process just rec um, represents just kind of this long process uh, and journey for me. Thank you. Now you write about health consequences of political economic processes such as poverty, inequality, racism. How did you get interested in this particular particular area? Yeah, so I honestly, I think one of the things that happened after I um, stopped doing bedside nursing is, um, and I went and started working for nonprofit organizations, it became very, um, kind of um, evident to me that there were other factors outside of the healthcare system that was impacting people's health and healthcare. And so um, I was a case manager and I was working, you know, at um, in Orlando, Florida, you know, trying to help people who were homeless receive healthcare services. And I will tell you that that's a very daunting task. Um, not only do they have, you know, don't have health insurance, you know, but there's a, a view and a perspective about people who are experiencing homelessness. And so people have these biases and these prejudices against that group of people. And so what I quickly found is that even though, you know, we had resources to be able to support them, they were still ostracized and you know mistreated by our healthcare system. We ended up creating a, a facility where we could provide them with some mental health, um, substance abuse treatment, um, case management services, counseling, you know, 
it was um, a full on attempt to provide all the different ancillary types of services that they needed. And then um, back in 2007, I had an opportunity to work with Healthy Start, which is an organization in Florida that helps women have healthy pregnancies. Um, and I started as a part of that job, there's a lot of research that goes into it, trying to understand the different dynamics for the different counties and different zip codes. And I quickly learned that um, infant mortality um, was something that um, it's a key indicator of the health of the community. And so what we found is that in predominantly black communities, black babies were dying at a disproportionate rate. And the unfortunate thing is that we still see those things. And now my um, kind of my research has expanded and I'm not just doing infant mortality, but I'm also doing maternal mortality. And there we have those same types of dismal rates. And so I just, um, I don't wanna say I stumbled upon this notion of racism, but when um, I did my dissertation back in 2011, I was looking at all these different factors that contribute to all these different, you know, disparate outcomes. And I quickly became, you know, quickly started to realize that there are um, systemic reasons why um, disparities persist. And racism is definitely one of them. And it's one of the ones that is controversial. And it's controversial because people hear the word racism and think you're calling them racist and think you're saying that they are racist doing something to harm people. And that's not the case. That's not what systemic racism really is. So there's tremendous opportunities to begin to educate people about how our systems are structured and how, you know, you think about something as, you know, should be just as normal as, you know, walking a straight line, which is having a baby. Um, you know, we get, um, I don't want to get too far into it, but I just want to say, you know, having a cesarean section should not be a normal part of childbirth. But we see a lot of Black women losing their lives because of the medicalization of, of pregnancy. Wow. And, you know, we really can't talk about health in inequities and racism without me bringing up Dr. Susan Moore um, out of Indiana, because that was um, probably her last plea, you know, that she was being mistreated because of her race um, and not specifically talking about that case, but how common is that? And she was a physician and she was crying out that she was being mistreated because of her race. How common is that to even the lay person? Yeah, um, it happens. Um, when we know that there are providers, provider bias, we know that these things um, happen and they, they exist. But the problem is when black women say that, you know, we're in pain, um, there is a perception that black women have a higher tolerance of pain. There's all of these misconceptions out there. And then when we describe our symptoms, we're not listened to. And so um, I tell this story about um, that happened to me. It's been about two years ago now, but I was at an event with this medical doctor and he said to me, he's an older white um, gentleman. And he said, um, you know, what I've learned about working with black women is sometimes you have to raise your voice with them. You have to, you know, you know kind of put the fear in them in order for them to listen. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I mean, I try not to show it on my face, but I'm like, what is wrong with this dude? This is not okay. And since that time, you know, in doing readings and research, I've come to understand that there is a thought out there that with we're, that black women will not be compliant with healthcare recommendations. And so for some providers, they feel like they have to do that. And so that is so unfortunate because as we know, especially as black women, that is not true. We don't want people yelling at us, um, talking you know, down to us or mistreating us. And so that's, that's our role as, as professionals. We've got to do a better job of educating these health care professionals that this is not the way to interact and to treat black women. It is not acceptable and we should not tolerate it. And so 
you know, I think that the more that we can have these types of dialogues and conversations, the more, you know, we can get people to understand our stories and our perspectives. And I will do one little plug for Black Mamas Matter. They've been doing a lot of policy work um, around this. And so my hope is that in the next couple of years that we'll begin to see some real change in this regard. Absolutely. And it really is a, a whole conversation within itself. Um, and, and just one more comment to expand on that. Um, I really think that not only the providers, but Black women need to know that this exists because there are some that they really don't realize that this is a thing, right? <laughs> and so, um, like you said, having the conversations, it actually can bring awareness to all parties involved. Absolutely, absolutely. And so one of the things that I've also been talking to women about is how to develop those relationships with healthcare providers. Um, we don't, I recently um, read something about some of the data that black women do better when they have a black doctor. Well, a lot of us don't have the ability to have a black doctor. We live in places where there's really no, you know, black healthcare providers in those areas. And so having, um, learning how to have a conversation and develop relationships with healthcare providers, it is so key for Black women. I mean, we have to figure out how to um, speak to our providers so that they recognize that when we're saying something is wrong, that they take us seriously. And it may sound like a minor trivial point, but it is very important. And a lot of times it's overlooked. Wow. Thank you for that. So I am a um, definite um, advocate of sharing challenges, obstacles, uh, barriers through our career. I actually, I lead the Women Who Lead where I intentionally um, ask women to share their challenges. And so I'm gonna ask you, what are some challenges that you faced in your career, but more importantly, how did you overcome them? Um. I guess I'll talk about, I'm in academia now and um, academia is often referred to as the ivory tower. Um, if you look at the people who are in presidencies and even in provost um, positions, oftentimes they don't look like me. And in some of our institution, people who are even at the Dean level don't look like me. And so I, I don't view it as a hindrance, but I know that there's work to do. I know that there's work to do because um, even if you look at the hiring of black faculty, it's not at the same rate as our white counterparts. And so for me, I'm looking at this as, and this is just kind of where I am right now because I do have aspirations to you know, move up in my career. And so I think for me, I don't really look at it as a barrier. I look at it as trying to understand what do I have to do in order to be successful? And I think this is sometimes where Black women, we get into trouble because we feel like not only do I need to be, you know, do a good job at where I am, I need to be the best. I need to be an overachiever. Like if we need to have a national prominence, that's not good enough. I've got to have an international following, you know. <laughs> so, so wherever we are, we feel like we have to just, you know, go gangbusters and, 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 and do too much. And so I think um, where I am right now is just trying to really bloom where I'm planted, right? And so I wanna be recognized as someone who um, supports other people, who um, I think about the Buddhist principles. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? So I've learned to soften my blow. I don't walk in with a big stick. Um, and that's not to say I'm a pushover because I am not. Um, I, I was in a, a meeting um, probably about two months ago with um, a colleague who was um, doing a, a training and I had a chance to speak up and talk about some of the barriers I face in academia. Um, the, the glass ceiling exists in academia, especially for black women. Um, and he told me this little affirmation, he says, I expect nothing but the best because I deserve nothing but the best. And that resonated with me. And so for me, I set my goal and I, I set my sights high because I think I'm worthy. I think I have something to offer. 
And once I get there, there's going to be nothing but other opportunities for other people. And so that's, you know, kind of like my underlying motivation. It's not all about me. It's about creating opportunities so that people who look like me have those same opportunities afforded to them. Now, you mentioned goals and someone of your caliber who have reached so many milestones. Um, there has to be a process. What steps do you take to reach your goals? Yeah, so I'll tell you about the many, the many steps. So every day um, during the week, now on the weekends, um, I have what I call big rocks, right? And there's three things that I want to do. I want to get these things done today. And if I do them, I will feel like I have succeeded for today. So um, these are things, these are not pie in the sky things. These are things that I need to do. So I have those, right? And then I set an intention. I believe that things, you know, some of my colleagues say, you don't have to set an intention. You want to write a book, just get up every day and write the book. I'm like, well, I can't do that. <laughs> I need a, I need some goals. I need to say, okay, I need an outline. You know, I need chapter one. And so that's how I unpack it, right? So um, for me, if there's a big project that I'm working on or somewhere I'm going, or if I want a new position, I figure out my strategy and it's like a chess game, right? I'm in there, I'm playing to win. I'm not moving checkers around on a checkerboard no hate or shade to checker players because I don't play that either. But, you know, I am all into creating a strategy and working my strategy. That's on my vision board because I think that that's how you get there. That works for me. Now, some people can wake up and roll with it. If I wake up and roll with it, I won't be rolling anywhere. I'll just <laughs> roll. <laughs> I love that. Let's have a strategy. I love that. So who or what inspires you? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm inspired by um, seeing other people succeed. Um, I recently published an article with um, two students, two undergraduate students and um, one of the lecturers in my department. And I, I mean, I've published articles before. It's their enthusiasm that made me feel like we'd hit the lottery. I mean, they were like, oh my God, Dr. V, this is great. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is great, you know? And so um, I have another student who's in law school. And so she tells me about her professors, but then the other day when she sent me her grades and they weren't where, you know, we needed them to be, they're okay. She's gonna move on, but she can do better. And so I just, um, that's my inspiration because this is not, like I said, this is not about me. This is about all of us. I am not one of those people who like, you know, and I, I guess I get it from, you know, being a basketball player, being in the military. You know, I remember being on those um, long, um, you know, road marches. If someone fell out or fell out of a run, you got to go back and get them. You don't just keep moving. No, we are a team let's go. And so that's kind of, you know, and I realize that everybody doesn't have that kind of mentality, that philosophy, but that's, that's where I am. And that's who I am. And so for me, you know, I get excited just by watching other people succeed. I'm, I'm the cheerleader. I did that too. But <laughs> Now, success looks different, you know, depending on who you're talking to. And we know that it can be quite subjective. But how do you define success and what does that look like for you? Absolutely. Success is what you make of it, right? And I think, you know, you can have success in your relationships. You can have success with your children. You can have success in your career. But you have to acknowledge your wins, you can't, like for me, it's not like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to acknowledge a win until I get to be the dean. Um, when I got the email to be able to participate on this call, I'm like, that's winning, you know? I, you know, have something on my vision board where I'm looking, you know, when I get these opportunities, I'm like, oh, I didn't even have to do anything and I'm already doing that. That's winning for me. And so for me, those are the successes that really matter. And so, um, I think, you know, I do um, jigsaw puzzles. And I think the reason I like jigsaw puzzles is because, you know, you put together a thousand pieces, a thousand piece puzzle, that's a thousand wins. 
like just those little that little snap when it snaps in the to place like I don't like those jigsaw puzzles that don't create that snap I need that snap because I need to and what they call it fully interlocking if it's not fully interlocking it just kind of fits together I don't like that I need my piece to snap into place that's winning <laughs> I love that I love it <laughs> It's almost like the check mark off your to-do list. You got to have that check mark. I love it. Small things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and, and still keep it in line with success. What skills would you say have helped you reach that level of success that you've reached? Yeah. Um, I am a consummate organizer. I I am organized over here, girlfriend. Um, and I say that like, um, you know, like my day, my task, um, I wake up, you know, I have my, I, I create my big rocks. Like what's, what am I doing today? Um, I write, I look at my calendar. If it's not on my calendar, it's not happening. Um, and so I think organ organization is like probably one of the things that because people always say how do you do so much I'm because I'm organized you know what there's a saying if you want something done give it give it to a busy person right because we can fit it in or we can't fit it in right um the other thing is you know I have um very good relationship with people I believe in deep relationships and um, I'm still dragging people along that I met in high school or middle school or even elementary school. I'm still connected with them. Um, I pride myself on relationships and I'm okay being the person who calls, who initiates the call. I'm okay with that. Um, I got hemmed up on that one time um, last year. Um, my cousin passed away and I remember thinking probably about three or four months before she passed away, I was like, I'm not gonna call her cause I'm always calling her. And you know, and I won't ever do that again. I'm the caller, I'm gonna call you, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Um, and it, it took that for me to realize that we all have roles to play in relationships. Wow even in our families, we have, you know, I've got somebody in my family who, you know, I may not hear from her for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, you know, but that's okay. Right. She can still look at her phone and say, Oh, Vanessa texted me, Vanessa called me like whatever. If she doesn't call me back, it's okay. <laughs> I, I realize, and I, I, I accept my role. And so because relationships are so important to me, that's what I do. So I think nurturing and maintaining relationships help keep me sane um, in this, um, what do you call it, in this um, virtual space that we find ourselves in right now. Um, I stay home a lot. Um, I have friends who are traveling, who are doing, you know, doing, going out to brunch and all that. And I'm just sitting here shaking my head. I absolutely not. I until I get my vaccine, absolutely not. You couldn't drag me up in there. There, until I love my people. I know people who own restaurants. I know that they're struggling. Um, I order out when I can, but absolutely not. Um, and I and I think the other thing is, I do care deeply for people, and I I realize that about me, and I'm learning my capacity to love. Um, I didn't think I could love a, a animal, but I, I thought my cat got out of the house and I was heartbroken. I was crying about a cat. Yes. First of all, it's not my cat. It's my daughter's cat. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it was now it's mine, but yeah. So I just, um, I learned, um, to grow my capacity to love and to care. And so I think that that's a part of my success. Um, my president of my university sent out an email last week and the last word is it that, you know, he's ended it with a phrase like, I love you, you know, not me personally, but you know, <laughs> to our, our campus community. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, he said he loves us. Like that just, the whole message went away and I was just stuck and struck by that line. That wow. capacity to demonstrate love and care and compassion for a community that's to me is so powerful. Wow. Thank you. So we've talked about success. We've talked about accomplishments. What are you most proud of in your career? Mm -hmm. 
I guess I'm, I'm most proud of um, these platforms because now I get to show my mama what I'm doing. Um, I used to make speeches all the time and she never got to see it. So yeah. I'm just, um, I'm so proud that I'm able to share my work and my service with my community. And so I do a little sharing on Facebook, but what makes me you know, really happy is when I can share something that I've done or supported with my mom and with my family and with my folks back you know, in Louisiana. And, you know, even when like sometimes I'm doing a, a talk and I'll put it on Facebook and then, you know, as I'm on a Zoom meeting with all these hundreds of people and I'll look down, and I'll see somebody from high school and I'm like, oh, my God, it just it makes me so happy on the inside. Like, I don't even they don't even they probably don't even know it, but it just it makes me happy that um, a little girl from Shreveport, Louisiana, who was born the year Martin Luther King was killed, is is doing something that's positive and making an impact. So, wow. So, what's next for Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton? Yeah. So, I love that question. Um, I don't know. I I really think I would like to be a dean. I think I would like to be a provost. And then I think I would like to be the president of a university. Wow. I think I have some, you know, tremendous skills that um, would serve a campus community very well. And so I wanted to put it out there and speak it into existence and let's see what happens. I love it. And how has your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network enhanced you professionally? Yeah, it... <laughs> well, the first thing I want to say is um, I started um, with the Black Doctoral Network when I was in Orlando and um, my colleagues and I went to one of the first conferences, I think it was either in Atlanta or DC, and we presented our work. And from there, I've had this um, tremendous relationships, um, tr tremendous relationship with a lot of the people who are um, from the Black Doctoral Network. And so I think... Um, where we are now um, is um, working with Deandra. Deandra is to really get the West Coast involved. Um, I think there's just a lot that's happening on the East Coast. And so now my goal is to, you know, we're here. We've got um, Black PhD folks all up and down this, um, this coast on the West. Um, and so um, for me, it's continuing to showcase and highlight the value, um, the, the existence of Black PhDs. And I'm gonna, well, let me say doctoral because I don't wanna throw shade at my EDD people <laughs> or other, other doctoral folks. So absolutely. And even um, students who are in this area, so. Dr. Lopez Littleton, thank you for joining us today. It has been a pleasure. Please tell our viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about you and the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. You can find me at drvlolil.com. That's D-R-V-L-O-L-I-L.com. Thank you. Please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, and we hope you will join us again next time. But for now, remember to like, share, subscribe, and tell a friend.